Um, I, I study games as texts. I don't think about games, I, like, I, you know, I have a lot of colleagues that study video game companies, that study video game players, but I'm really interested in what we can learn from looking at game texts. And so um, I'm not really used to talking to games full of developers, so um, I apologize in advance if I'm doing it wrong. Uh, I typically speak to rooms of academics that know varying amounts of the things that I'm going to talk about today. So it's, it's a little hard to gauge what, where, we're, where we're all coming to in this conversation. So, um, but my, my book is titled Ready Player Two. And it, I titled it that with a full acknowledgement of the uh, popular dystopian novel, Ready Player One. Who in here has read Ready Player One? Or, okay, a few of you. Um, Ready Player One takes place in a dystopic future where the inhabitants seek solace in an imaginary game world. And it's, this imaginary game world is one that's based entirely on the creator's fetishizations of the 1980s popular culture. And while like any Gen Xer, I'm all about fetishizing 1980s popular culture, um, when I read the book, something sat wrong with me because through its constant references to movies like Real Genius and Revenge of the Nerds and sort of glorifications of 1980s geek um, figures like Steve Wozniak, the book makes it very clear who its vision of player one is, a white, heterosexual, cisgendered male. And rhetorically, the book seems to be arguing that this is the image that player one is based on. He is an industry construction that all video games seem to center themselves around. And through all of this, Ready Player One reifies something that's already um, accepted in popular culture. It creates, th there's a specific path of who a gamer is, what a gamer gets to look like, and what that gamer gets to play. So to shorthand it, we have been led to believe that a typical gamer looks like this, <laughs> and not like this. Um, this was actually a cover of Wired Magazine, I, I think around 2007 or so. Um, and that good games, productive games, games that benefit the industry um, and the overstated vision of player one should look like this, not like this. But that is not the reality. Um, games and gamers look like a lot of different things, as many of you I'm sure already know. And because the video game industry itself is so male dominated, 22% um, women at this point, again, as I'm sure all of you know this, um, that um, that is not what the perception of what what the gaming public looks like. So in reality, it doesn't matter who actually plays video games. The perception is all that matters. And in turn, about half of all gamers don't get to decide what games are important. And this particularly applies to those that don't play what are often referred to as hardcore games, right? So in recent years, there's there has been a lot uh, a lot of people have remarked upon um, the privilege of the white geek male, both in um, popular press and in academic writing. And recent criticisms of this character highlight that the geeky white male perpetuates sexist, heterosexist, and racist undercurrents. That's not to say that, that, it, that it's the representation of that character, not you know anyone who inhabits the possibilities of that character, right? So this white geeky guy has been idealized and monetized upon in popular culture to the extent that he is now the central market for the primary video game industry, the console and the PC gamer. Player one is then a complicated yet important figure in the video game industry. Player two, however, gets to be everyone else. And so in this talk, I'm going to refer to player two sort of as a, in a shorthand for a lot of different things, but for now, let's assume that she's kind of the shadow of the female gamer. So how did we get here? Um, and was it always this way? Um, so in the 80s and 90s, female video game players were by and large in the minority. Neither women nor girls were the primary market, of course, this being one of the uh, more absurd exceptions for uh, games. And Research at that point started to show that girls with an interest in video games were more likely to enter STEM careers. So several studies and initiatives began to suggest how game design might be an easy fix for this problem. After some time, several researchers, myself included, became interested in women in video games, specifically studying what the barriers to entry for getting women more interested in video games might be and why we should even care whether or not women are playing video games. And suddenly, a weird thing happened. Around the early aughts, um, 
more video games did dis begin to be designed for women players and specifically um, a lot of what is often referred to as casual games as I'm sure you all know the, the nomenclature in the industry. Um, and those casuals were deliberately being designed for women audiences. But those games, while highly popular, often have been made fun of by sort of the larger gaming public. So this reflects a larger um, narrative where there's a gendering of media. And this is kind of this long running problem in media where you see um, women's it, media that's intended specifically for women audiences is often sort of treated as not quite as good. So romance novels, soap operas, um, chick flicks, um, you know, and sort of, and, and you, like a, a good, um, a good way to look at it is kind of from the, in the 1950s, the, um, the criticism of melodrama versus the um, critics lauding of film noir, right? It's the same sort of like, there, there's a gendering of media and, and media that's intended specifically for women audiences, regardless of the aesthetic value of that is often sort of um, demeaned. So, and that's where we get into what I do. I'm interested in this gamer. I'm interested in the shadow of a woman gamer. She is the presumed player of many of these games, but I should note that all kinds of people play all kinds of games, of course, right? Um, it's not necessarily just her who's playing this game, but this is this presumed player that's built into games. And in order to study this gamer, it is about talking to people who actually play games. It's about examining the games to understand how they are designed for a perceived player. So not only is this player biologically female, but she's also white, middle class, and heterosexual. Um, and the term that I use to sort of wrap around all of this is designed identity. Um, and designed identity is, it's, I'm not talking about real lived identities. I'm not talking about what, you know, the, the identity people actually hold. I'm talking about a hybrid outcome of industry conventions, textual constructs, and audience expectations. So games designed for women um, are structured in ways that make for some kind of complicated play. And this is not about blame. This is not about, you know, I, this isn't a, a question of like, you know, damn you video game industry for making this. It's more of a question of looking at larger patterns of cultural constructions to get a better understanding of how we as a society think about play and how we understand different um, groups in that society should play or should not play. So instead of thinking about this as blame, we can understand it on a more ideological level. Part of the complexity here deals with issues of women in leisure. This is my, for some reason, this is the slide I always choose for women in leisure. I don't know why, but like this sort of weird iconic image of women hula hooping in the 50s. Um, but women have this complicated relationship with leisure. Women's leisure is often um, meant to, it, like it has aspects of productivity built into it. Um, and it's also often cheap or free. It can be, and it, it can be done in short snippets of time or longer periods of time. So it's basically leisure that can be fit into whatever time is available to you. So um, leisure that can be performed between the you know 20 minutes between um, you know getting off of work and picking your kid up from soccer practice kind of leisure. And the games that I'm going to discuss today are games that are built for an intended woman audience. Um, in the games of the past, if the games of the past could be characterized by like big narratives and overwhelming gameplay, these stories can be characterized by their smallness. Um, the games themselves are smaller, both in scope, bless you, and in narrative. Their play styles are different, although more complicated than we often acknowledge. And, and I can't put too fine of a point on this. These games that we often are very dismissive of, myself included sometimes, are important. To ignore these games would be a mistake. So what does designed identity play with? In my book, I break it down into four major categories. Um, playing with time, playing with emotions, playing with consumption, and playing with bodies. So while I talk about these right, it, like sort of in, as distinct categories, there's some overlap throughout. So I talk about certain games kind of throughout this w in, um, in the ways that they overlap through different categories. So time, women don't have time. And time is the one thing that we need in order to play, right? In order to play productively, in order to, to, um, to play in a way that um, has meaning, we need time, all of us need time. So I've already mentioned that women in, with women in leisure, that's already a very complicated topic. Um, so 
a lot of this comes to a question of time management. Um, time management products in general tend to be uh, marketed specifically to women. So like day planners, all of that, that, the, that whole line, that whole industry is marketed to women more than it is to men. And um, Arlie Russell Hochschild refers to this as the second shift, um, which I, are, are any of you familiar with the term the second shift? I'm seeing a couple of nods, but uh, um, so the second shift is sort of in the um, 1980s, sort of after second wave feminism, after sort of the feminism of the 1970s when sort of middle class white women were returning to the labor force, there was a question of were women, you know, no longer, they, they were leaving their sort of domestic labor that was performed at home and moving into a workplace. But what many women found is that they had really two full-time jobs. So a full-time job in an office and a full-time job at home. And of course, some of that has shifted in recent years and, and you know, domestic labor has certainly been more distrib uh, distributed. There's no question of that. But there's still sort of this very complicated relationship between women, work, and play, and specifically as it applies to the domestic sphere. And time management games. Who in here has heard the phrase time management game? So that it's it's a kind of casual. Um, um, primarily, you can it, like you can find them if you go to bigfish.com. You can find hundreds of time management games, and um, the so the time management game is a um, most of them are based off of Diner Dash, which I'll talk about in a moment. But even the label itself taps into anxieties that provoke the same things as time management products, right? Um, this conflation between work and play, this this question of when you're supposed to work and when you're supposed to play. So um, Diner Dash uh, is sort of the proto time management game. Um, and for those of you that have never dipped into Diner Dash, and I imagine most of you at some point have encountered Diner Dash in your lives because it, it's been out there for such a long time and in so many different formats, but it, it's like the proto game for time management games, right? So. Um, there are um, dozens of games in the Flash uh, Dash universe, most of which um, Flo, if she's not the protagonist, then she sort of, um, then she makes cameos in it and helps out. But um, it, the, the Dash first includes Diner Dash, Wedding Dash, Doggy Dash, Parking Dash, Cooking Dash, Fitness Dash. I'm not even naming half of them right now. Um, and so um, one of the ways, who in here has played Diner Dash at some point? Okay, so about half of you. Basically, in Diner Dash, you're um, you're running, you're managing a restaurant. You own a restaurant, but really, you're working doing management of a restaurant, and you're just trying. You're you are waiting on tables and cleaning up in order to um, bring in as many customers as possible. And uh, Diner Dash is a game that uh, that that has a very high, or has always had a very high percentage of women audience. Um, I forgot that I, at one point I had the percentage down and I don't have it offhand, but, um, but one of the things about Diner Dash that has always interested me is how work and play become impossible to disentangle. Play becomes work and work becomes play. And in Diner Dash, we perform the labor of restaurant work on behalf of Flo, our protagonist. So Flo's story and her in-game work play is always deeply embedded in this relationship between work and play. Um, our play becomes her work, but because we're playing as Flo, we're taking over her work in order to play. And this work is never done. Flo waits on tables, she buses trays, she cleans up messes, she entertains customers. And in turn, this work done by Flo becomes the play work of the game player. And this complicated relationship between work and play is seen, to me, is best articulated through a, um, a game called Avenue Flo, which was this um, it's kind of a, puzzle game version of the of Diner Dash. Um, it's Flo goes around town solving um, non-fatal mysteries like missing dogs and stuff. Uh, and this is the opening cut scene for Diner for uh, Avenue Flo. Oh, wait, that was working for a moment. That had previously worked. Let's see if we... Let's try that again. Just don't have the time to relax. Gotta keep these diners in the black. The coffee is brewing, the customers are chewing your whole 
life feels like an interlude when you're serving up cartoon food. So I just don't have the time to sit down. No time to sit. Busy as street in all of Diner Town. Some call it Florida Street, but they're not in the know. What we have here is video game, a form of leisure, with an opening clip, with an opening cutscene that uses the lines, I just don't have the time to relax, I don't have the time to sit down, and my whole life feels like an interlude. And it seems unlikely, even laughable, that a game in the Halo or Grand Theft Auto series would begin with a cutscene describing the player or avatar's lack of free time, right? I mean, that the, the idea of that seems pretty laughable. Um, it seems to be saying two things at the same time. First, use your leisure time to play this game, but with a wink, but we really know you don't have any leisure time. Um, so as the genre of time management game developed, it turned into a new gaming style, what is commonly referred to now as Invest Express. Um, more than any other game company, Zynga is, can be credited for the em emergence of Invest Express, although it has been sort of exploded out by other game companies like Glue and StoreMade. And in Invest Express games like Farmville, and uh, this is Farmville and Restaurant Story, um, in Invest Express games, you're given the player is given sparse, small spaces and the ability to sort of decorate as um, tasks and customers come through. They're you know they provide you with small assignments and errands, and then you gain money from those things in order to decorate your spaces better. And there's always a limiting of energy in these games, so. Um, you always have to play a little bit and then come back. And of course, as with all um, pay to play games, time equals money. Um, the Invest Express games structure real world time in such a way so that the player on one hand can't always, can't play endlessly, but on the other hand needs to always come back and play the game a little bit more. And to this end, Invest Express has pulled the most compelling aspects from the time management game and expanded them outward. The games in this space are about staying busy, about constant movement and constant work, even within play. Um, so uh, this is the description for Farmville 2 Country Escape, and you can't really read it from that distance, but it says, running a farm is loads of fun in this fresh sequel to the classic world builder. Zynga's latest offering presents a wealth of activities to keep you busy, including milking cows, harvesting fruits and vegetables, fishing, unlocking new uh, areas, decorating your property, and even selling items to friends. So note how quickly, it, like in the same breath, it uses the word fun and busy, right? It's, it's all sort of one big package. Um, I'm sorry? I'll yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, and if the co common cultural understanding of femininity and adult women is that she's busy, too busy to play, then a game that both functions in small snippets of time while also simultaneously focuses on having the player return for subsequent snippets of time that would be an ideal format for that player, right? Um, and in this way, Invest Express seems to be the perfect articulation of the perception of the woman player's leisure time. The realities of this leisure, of course, lie somewhere between the cultural perceptions and the lived experiences. The maturation of time management games into Invest Express games seems to illustrate a desire to capture women audiences on their own terms. And yet, there's some trickery embedded in the construction of time management games. Of course, time management games don't really manage time um, or track it for that matter. They play with time. They appear to be productive through the visage of time, but they are purely leisure. And this conflation of productivity with play makes leisure appear constantly tenuous and never fully developed. The resulting leisure time becomes almost elastic, much as uh, researcher Natasha Dauchal describes of casino time. So like you sort of, um, when you're in a casino, time is elastic, right? You lose that time, it's, you have no sense of time. But at the same time, elasticity is not always negative when you think about it in this way, because it creates allowances, building pockets of time into places where there hadn't been pockets of time before. That's pretty important, right? If somebody doesn't have any time for leisure, but somehow this is expanding outwards, creating pockets of time, well, that's that's pretty incredible. Um, my, this is my playing with my, my angry bird, uh, dealing with their emotions. Um, <laughs> so much like time, uh, games designed for women audiences often play with emotions. Um, 
in media and culture, women are often portrayed as emotional, unable to control their emotions, right? Crying at movies or, or commercials with puppy dogs in them, right? Like just unable to contain all of the emotions. And so um, Joan Toronto, one researcher writes about how there's a general understanding that men care about things, whereas women care for things, which kind of summarizes the whole problem. Um, we, we think of women as cultural caregivers um, in general, we, we require that labor of them, but we also mock women for being too emotional in the, the, the exact work we need of them, right? So we sort of say, women do this work, but ha ha ha, right? That, but but that's, that's silly because they're being too emotional. So it's, it's kind of a constant contradiction that is um, built into culture. And so Arlie Russell Hochschild um, of second shift fame uh, that I referred to earlier, um, she refers to emotional labor, um, which is labor that requires an, an, indiv an individual to sublimate their own emotions and take on the emotional burdens, uh, the, the burdens of another person's emotional state. So uh, according to Haas, child emotional labor is primarily supplied by female labor. So jobs such as flight attendants, waitresses, and nurses are all examples of emotional labor. And um, sometimes this is also referred to as affective labor in uh, sort of in domestic and household contexts. Um, so one of the key ways that emotional labor functions in video games designed for women audiences is through hearts. Um, one researcher, um, Linda Burke, wrote in a book, Feminism in the Biological Body. And in this book, she, she describes how the constructions of hearts in um, sort of literary and cultural contexts always um, are always gendered, right? So um, masculine representations of the heart are always describing, you know, the heart is a pump, right? That, that sort of the biomedical terminology of hearts, which, and I am no biologist, so uh, I could be wrong in this, but my understanding of it is that the heart is not actually a pump, um, but that's sort of the common cultural representation of the heart, right? Um, Whereas feminized representations of the heart are always like the Valentine's Day heart, right? The, the, the emotional heart. And what's interesting is that this plays out in video games. Um, so in casuals like Diner Dash, you see the heart is, um, de describes the emotion, so like you gain hearts because you're winning over the love of your customers. Whereas, what, what does it imply in a game like Grand Theft Auto? So yeah, your body, your self health, health, right? Like your, um, your, your avatar's health levels. So um, it's kind of interesting the way that gaming kind of plays out those metaphors. Um, though in some time management games, emotion also functions as a play point in the narrative. And this is a screenshot from a cutscene in the Delicious Emily game series, um, which uh, is a particularly passive aggressive scene. That, uh, for those who can't see it, it says, leave then, I do everything around here anyway, um, or something to that effect, it's hard to, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, and in this series, we begin with Emily meeting her future husband, and as each game progresses through, a, like, each period in her life, the cutscenes function almost like soap operas, like these little mini soap operas that you gain as you complete a level. So it combines the labor of time management with the labor of emotional engagement. Um, emotional labor plays a role in puzzle games too, like Hungry Baby's Mania, um, which combines the manic speed of time management games and um, puzzles with the emotional desire to feed teeny little babies. Um, and lest you think that I'm making fun of this game, this is like one of the most consistent games I play in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I am not mocking this game. It's kind of an awesome game. Um, my husband doesn't understand it at all, um, but but you know, I'm, I'm deeply invested in this game. Uh, Another good example is in bubble popper games, which strangely commonly use a theme of a mommy animal rescuing her baby animals. Um, so in this screenshot, I deliberately failed so that you can see um, Celia the seal <laughs> crying and her baby's crying because I wasn't able to rescue the baby. Um, so um, <laughs> a Tamagotchi and pet games play with our desire for affect and emotion. and. So again, if men care about things and women care for things, it continues this theme of maternal caregiving as play. And so, um, of course, it, certainly in Tamagotchi, maybe not all pet games, but certainly in Tamagotchi, losing the game means killing your offspring. Um, but <laughs> there's a turn towards um, positive affect, I think, in games as well, though, which can be seen in Niko Tsumi, which I assume many of you have played because Niko Tsumi is awesome. Um, but, uh, 
with Nico Atsumi, the player isn't so much charged with caregiving as a mode of keeping something alive as it is a means of spreading love to many different cats. And when you don't feed your cats, they wander off, presumably to other people's yards. This kind of affective labor offers the emotional benefits of caregiving without all of that Tamagotchi guilt. Um, so the next topic that I'm going to talk about is um, how designed identity plays with consumption. Because um, consumption, like all of the other topics that I've talked about today, is kind of tricky because on the one hand, it provides opportunities for buying into a culture, right? Like, you know, if you're consuming, you're, you, you have that opportunity to buy into a culture. But on the other hand, when you're buying a culture, when you're buying into something, you're never fully a legitimate part of that culture. You're purchasing in your identity into it. Um, and consumption here it makes sense because women have long been constructed as shoppers. So um, women are shoppers in that they're material girls who shop till they drop and eventually have to deal with a confessions of shopaholic kind of lifestyle, right? We, we have this con cultural construction that women consume, women shop. Um, and this association between women and shopping, unsurprisingly, gets parsed into a lot of fashion games or games that involve paper doll style clothing. So um, Covet Fashion, for example, uses Pinterest style to mix game and real world shopping and turn it into a mode of play. And that brings us to the messy, fascinating, glorious, and terrible game, Kim Kardashian Hollywood. Um, and so it was released by Glue, who has played KKH in here? Who is admitting that? <laughs> um, so uh, it was released in 2014 by Glue. It's actually in some ways a very well-designed game and in some ways a very poorly designed game all at once. That, that's sort of like I wish there have been many times when I've wished I'd been able to like sit down with the, the people designing KKH and, and just ex like, don't you understand this is how people are playing it? Ah. But um, so it, com it, it combines a lot of the things I've already talked about today. So it's an invest express time management uh, kind of game that has the emotional labor of relationships and an excess of consumption through a confusing array of purchasing mechanics. Um, and the game made over 200 million in its first year and Glue's mobile stock rose over 42%. So anyone who thinks that this game isn't significant is missing something because this game is really significant. Um, one Jezebel author um, confessed to having spent over $500 in the first week of the game and she's not alone. Um, it's one of the highest grossing mobile games of all time, and the game is played a lot. People spend money on this game, and it is, love it or hate it, important. Um, this, by the way, is me and my baby Pickles. Um, <laughs> so, anyway. Um, <laughs> so, the beauty of KKH is the uh, combination of all of the things I've talked about today. The intensity of a time equals money mentality. The notion that you need to pay people in order to make them like you. The purchase and purchase things in order to win the game, of which, of course, you can never really win. Um, and there, the different kinds of money in KKH function almost as a kind of three card Monty. So you never fully can understand where your money has gone because of all the dizzying exchange rates of the system and a constant need to, to continue to buy in. So KKH turns consumption itself into a game that seems perfectly designed for a female audience. And this brings us back to the idea of buying into and purchasing into a culture because on the one hand, KKH with KKH, we're purchasing into the Kardashian lifestyle, for whatever that's worth. And on the other hand, we're purchasing into something bigger. This is an allowable space where women are being permitted into sort of the video game culture. Though KKH and similar, um, through KKH and similar games, diversity is given an opportunity to um, purchase into gaming culture with the caveat that it's never considered fully legitimate culture. And finally, we arrive at playing with bodies because bodies are behind everything, particularly when we're talking about video games. Play necessitates bodies, but it can also design those bodies and preference certain kinds of bodies over other kinds of bodies. Technology molds us just as much as we mold our technologies. Um, so to that end, gaming bodies preference certain positions and styles of movements. I can play a console game standing on my head with my back turned to the screen, but I'm not going to play it very well, right? There are certain ways to position my body, there are certain ways to sit that that game is trying to get me to do in order to play that game effectively. Similarly with a mobile game, I can, 
I can play like that, but I'm not going to do a very good job of it. It like it requires that I kind of sit here like this and you know hunch over it. There are certain things that it trains my body, right? So um, and with We and Connect for sure, there are um, there may be more freedom of movement, but there's always a kind of necessitated structure behind that movement. So that movement in the end echoes what we see on screen. We control our screens, and our screens control us. The problem for many years, of course, has been one of representation. Women didn't see themselves on the screen enough, or when they did, they fell into what one could refer to as the Laura Croft paradigm. Um, but now, there is, now that there's an increasing number of games that are being made for women, games have started to push at those bodies, and they're still doing it, though, in very distilled ways. So if the Laura Croft representation could, was characterized by curves, the characters designed for women audiences can be characterized by their flatness. Um, and I don't mean flatness necessarily in terms of chest size, but rather visual design. Um, so the asexual flow from Diner Dash, or the cartoonish lush characters such as Candy Crush, um, or cute animals replacing human bodies altogether. Um, or else the complete invisibility of hidden object games. So in a hidden object game, often you have no body at all, so you kind of move things around in a ghostly way. Um, and each of these things solves the problem and also kind of sidesteps it. Um, video games need bodies, but bodies are always a problem because bodies define the expectation of who an audience is. Also limiting the scope of possibility within that very audience. Um, Alternatively, games like Kim Kardashian Hollywood or Katy Perry Pop create a default setting of gaming bodies. And you can make your skin dark, although your experience can only be an experience of privilege in these games, right? The, it builds an experience of privilege where the whole point of it is to, you know, miraculously become famous. <laughs> um, it, it's built into the very narrative. So we can define our bodies, but only so far um, because some bodies are more desirable than other bodies as gamers. And for player two, those bodies are necessarily, necessarily constructed as white, middle class, heterosexual, cisgendered, enabled, and also kind of often mothers. Um, so just as player one was designed to look a lot like this, in the end, player two ends up looking a lot like this. This is the desirable body of player two in all of her glory white, middle-class, maternal, heterosexual, cisgendered, abled, and happy to play whatever she's given. But player two is not Martha Stewart. Like player one, player two is not an actual person. She's a shadow cast by an industry and a gaming public. We have set stereotypes of what player two looks like, and currently she, like player one, is white, middle-class, heterosexual, and cis. But these are not the only possible things that player two can be. She can be anyone, and she does not necessarily have to be female. She gives us an opportunity to rethink everything. Player two has the potential, and she's here to buy in and then disrupt what has been made for her. She gets to look at what player one has done for all of its beauty and all of its flaws, and she gets to hit the reset button. So that is what I've got today. I'm happy to take questions and uh, discuss. Thank you. Interesting. So they're, they have a concept of, um, you know, the idea of heart feminism being about seeing the heart as this thing that actually, you know, takes things into it, and that's sort of, you know, rhetorically significant if you're talking about it in terms of feminism. So. Well, and I think it's it's very easy to forget that sort of the everyday narratives that we hear in our lives are not without, um, they, they come from someplace, and we, we've, once you narrativize something, you've turned a story into something else in some way, and you've reconstructed that story. So. Um, everything has politics, right? And I don't mean that in terms of like every everything is voting, but every but everything that we um, that all the stories we tell are have the baggage of the culture that it comes from, for sure. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, 
I mean, I, I think that we don't know what to do with bodies in video games. I don't think it's just an issue of women's bodies. I think there is a, there's a bigger problem of like, do we idealize those bodies? Do we make those bodies us? Do we make them cute little me's? Do we, like, what do we do with those bodies? And how do we sort of lose the body, right? Because the whole point in gaming in a lot of ways is to, to make the, the avatar not exist because we want to be that avatar. We, we want to be what is doing the thing. And the more complex the body is, the, the more we're reminded on a constant basis that that body is not us. However, we need a body in a game, right? And we need a body outside of a game. So there's always this, this inherent problem that I don't know that anybody has really done a great job of figuring out how to debunk yet. I, I think that it's still a problem that will, that maybe VR will start to break down as that sort of progresses into a real thing or a more complex thing. Yeah. So a lot of what your presentation was, I think, was, was talking about the way that, that thus far things have been created for and marketed to women. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any speculation on on what may be happening or what, what you would like to see happening in terms of what kinds of games are targeted at women? Or, or, should, I or, should, games, or should games be targeted at everybody regardless of gender. I mean, I think that that's like, that would be lovely, but that's naive. I mean, nothing is targeted at everybody. I mean, there's everything has a demographic. I mean, like movies have demographics, television shows have demographics. There's no, there, there are no things that are just created in, you know, in mass media that don't have a demographic. And I don't always feel that it's my place to answer that question because, you know, I, I'm more interested, everything is going to always have baggage to it, right? And so I think that like my role is more to disentangle that and try and understand what's going on and what that can tell us about our culture. I, I don't have recommendations because it's always going to be messy. If it weren't messy, then it wouldn't be humanity. But, but there are women, of course, who even if, if things are targeted towards the white cis male gamer or mm -hmm. whatever, there are still many, many, many women mm -hmm. and, and people of those other categories play. Sure, absolutely. So. But that's not the designed player. That's not the player that, that was. So one of the more, more sort of jarring moments in my research was when I, I was doing some looking around online and I found a, um, an interview with someone from Storm 8 who was talking about um, the game Restaurant Story, which is an Best Express game. And he was talking about Jennifer. He, he was explaining that Jennifer was this woman from Milwaukee that they designed Restaurant Story mm. for. And Jennifer, of course, being a fictional character, you know, player type that they came up with. And I know that some, I know a lot of, I, a lot of game designers use player types, but I was really struck by this idea of Jennifer, right? Like who is Jennifer? And the problem with having that player type so specific is that you do, you end up with parameters, right? You end up, you know, um, Jennifer is most likely about 35 years old, is white, is middle class, has a couple of kids. Like you, you end up sort of loading Jennifer down with a whole bunch of stuff that is not necessarily fair for all of your players and it doesn't represent all of your players. It's, you know, Jennifer gets to take on the baggage of everyone's leisure, which is weird. <laughs> you had your, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just saying how, I was just saying it's topic was very interesting. Okay. I liked it a lot actually because when I was growing up, I didn't really see a difference between feminine games and male th games thrown mm -hmm. to females and games thrown to men. Because I used to go home, play the Xbox with my like, Gears of War, but when dad came home and wanted to play his Gears of War, I would stop and go play my um, <laughs> hidden object games and my die dash and my <laughs> wedding dash and all those games. Now I'll go back to that. See, I never really saw a difference in that. I didn't, but I kind of understand why when I was younger, I was always bought those type of games. Right. Because I was like, I, I would never get construction building game. I always get like, Dash or, you know, I, just, I love those games for the story and stuff, right? but yeah. you still play Gears of War. I still play Gears of War, though. I still went back to play Halo and right. played my Assassin's Creed. I mean, I think that, you know, the, those things can be constructed and not everyone will notice them, right? Like, I, I think that, yeah, I you know, know yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. 
it's changing, but like, I mean, so with Kim Kardashian Hollywood and the other glue ones like that, like, so it's weird. Like on the one hand, I can, I can make myself, I can change my bodily appearance without any um, repercussions during gameplay. And actually I went through a time period where like every day, every time I changed my outfit, I would change what I looked like to see if it changed how I like felt in the game world. And it did sometimes, there were moments where I was like, who is that? <laughs> um, because I was changing it so often and then finally I stopped because it got exhausting. But um, the, the the reality is is that like I could only change certain, there, there were very specific things that I could change. I couldn't change my body type at all. Um, and also you can't, um, interestingly, um, given the, uh, the realities of the Kardashian family, for better or worse, there's, I can't, I, I assume it's because of gameplay mechanics, but I can't change from male to female. That's one of the few things that it just, there's, I, you can't do that. I can change my sexual preference like hourly, um, but I can't change from male to female. No, that's funny. Um, and I mean, like, it's not even, it's like, it's not even a question of deliberately changing my sexual preference. It's more like if somebody comes over and flirts with me in the game world, then I can, it, it just makes no difference. There, it, it does not change, it does not acknowledge any difference between my flirting with men and flirting with women in the game. Um, which, which is kind of like there. There are a lot of opportunities that I think KKH has for breaking some, breaking apart some things. I think, for whatever it's worth, for I, I say to a room full of game developers, um, I think the problem was that they got too diffuse and tried to make all of the celebrity games rather than improving the one celebrity game that they started with. Had they actually like sat down and figured out like how people play KKH and tried to really improve that game rather than trying to make Katy Perry pop, Britney Spears, whatever, um, Kylie and Kendall. Um, there's a Jason Stratham shooter game that I, a sniper game that I really, like I do not under, I tried to play that game and I have no idea what's even happening um, or why I'm Jason Stratham. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think there's a Nicki Minaj game coming out. Like they, they, def they became too diffuse in terms of all of the different celebrity games, not thinking about the fact that there's only so much market for a celebrity game and they probably captured it already. So if they put that time, if, I, if only I could sit down with the CEO of Glue and just talk to him. <laughs> yeah. I was almost saying, oh, I think maybe I can't include all the generations. I know you said Laura Croft thing, but I actually did grow up on Laura Croft actually. And I, as you see, Laura Croft back then, but Laura Croft now is more flat chested. She's more slimmer. It's like the female empowered sure. gamer. And don't you think it kind of improves now? Because, you know, she's I mean, nothing like she was right She's now. more athletic. More athletic. athletic. I mean, and, like, I know the new game, I have not played the most recent game, and but I know that there is both things that people like better about it and things that people like worse about it. I know that, that, that it sits in this very um, centralized debate <laughs> of, yeah. of what what is and is not wrong with the with Laura Croft. Um, but, I mean, I, I'm not that interested in games that are not deliberately designed for women. That's not to say that women don't play Laura Croft or, or Tomb Raider games rather, but that I'm really interested in these games that like, I feel like people don't pay that much attention to, mm -hmm. that people don't put a lot of thought into because I, one of the things that really blew my mind was when I was coming, I was writing the gameography for this book and I had to go through and find out all of, you know, for the gameography, all of the developers and all of the, all of the information about all the games. And there were so many games that like got lost in the ether. And I was finding myself spending hours online trying to figure out who the hell made this game. Right. And like, that's something that should be really sad to you guys. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, like yeah. that these games that people put time and energy and love one way or another into a lot of these games. And they're, they're so small that they get forgotten, There's and no MDB. Really. They're, no, it's it, and they're not usually on movie games either. Like a lot, like I went to all of the typical sources essentially for to find out the background information on these games, and I had to do some serious sleuthing to get basic information about the year it came out, about like whether or not the producer and the developer was the same, about like all the things that we take for granted when we're looking at you know big budget games these games are just so ephemeral and that ephemerality I think is worth talking about. Whereas, you know, we, we, you know, a lot of people talk about Tomb Raider that's because it's a really big series, right? But 
but people don't talk about hungry babies mania because it's smaller it's it's just it's a it's a thing that happened not something that people think about as a uh, narrative or artistic endeavor for whatever you know whether or not that I would love to see that change. I actually, at, while I was doing the gameography, I was like, I am going to make a database. I'm going to do this. And then I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do that. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a lovely idea, but I don't know. So um, after, like, I, I, I need to think about how to approach the casual market next to find a way to, to, for people to remember that these games existed, right? Like, I keep thinking about the early days of television where there were so many broadcasts that it was, you know, it was before people taped broadcasts. Broadcasts just happened live over, you know, over television. And so we don't have record of half of the things that happened, which is really sad. And I feel like casuals in many ways have the same thing has happened, not because we don't have the ability, but because it never occurred to anyone that somebody might want to archive these games. The question I actually had was, um, I love your breakdown of the games and how they, they, they encourage one of the gender identities and things and stuff. I was curious to hear your take on like Pokemon Go, specifically because some reports have said that more women play it than men do, but I don't feel like it was necessarily a game that had a gender bias in design. Um, I mean, I think that, well, so I think that like, for sure, Pokemon Go is tapping into millennial uh, love of Pokemon, right? So like right there, I think that that helped quite a bit. I think also a lot of women played Ingress. So it was like an easier, tra it was a very neat and easy and clean transition for those who did play Ingress already or, or had played it at some point or had a uh, partner that had played it. You know, like it, it was something like, oh, I'm familiar with that kind of. So I'm just gonna, you know, I, I, could, I can do that for a while. I mean, I, I think that Pokemon Go had tons of potential and was in a lot of ways very Invest Express. I mean, it wasn't exactly, but it had a lot of the premises of Invest Express. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why it was successful for the you know, 30 days, it was like super successful. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it, like, yeah, I, I, I thought it was actually a very clever design. It was a much more clever design than Ingress in a lot of ways. So um, I thought that they did a great job of tapping into a lot of different audiences at once in um, in, a, in a pretty fun way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You, I wanted to ask if you have any interest or thought at all about um, doing this in terms of uh, games that are for girls or for feminine audiences that are children. Because I know there's been, obviously, like Brenda Laurel kind of had mm -hmm. the corner on that market in the 1980s and 90s. Right. But I was just thinking of, you know, my niece, like, is totally allowed to have free reign of the iPad, and mm -hmm. so all the games that are downloaded for her are like nail salon. You I know. know. There, I've heard that salon there's a lot of like princess cleaning games. Yeah, there's I'm, all of these <laughs> very interesting. There's a lot of like very graphic birth ones too that seem like they just heard about they those. filter very carefully, and like a lot of ones that are, yeah are about. Yeah, I've heard. I know that there's there's a frozen birth one where you can like right. you can be like and, uh, yeah, like and really you can be her. Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. I haven't really delved into that, mostly because when I started this project, my feeling was that people were paying too much attention to kid games, and I was like, why don't we care about grown-ups, right. right? Like, why don't we care whether or not grown-ups play? And that's obviously shifted a lot, but that's sort of... And one of the interesting things that happened to me over the course of when this was a dissertation to now is that when... When I was writing this, is you know, when it was my dissertation, I was single in my 30s, early 30s, and um, you know, and and a grad student, and um, I just sort of like I was like, oh, look at these crazy games. They, you know, like they are clearly marketed to this audience. Oh, ha ha ha! And I realized at some point while I was writing this book that in the interim, I had become the target audience that the games <laughs> were marketing to, and that was a really weird moment, right? I'm like, oh, I'm I am. I am the, the woman, I am the person that, that they want player two to be. And that's troubling, and I don't know where to put that. Um, and sometimes it, like, you know, sometimes I have to take that step back from the games and ask myself, like, well, what what's going on with me right now? <laughs> that, you know, why is it that I'm only playing uh, Hungry Babies Mania and I'm not playing other games aside from that? What, you know, what what is this doing for me and how is this constructing, you know? 
in, in my life. So, I mean, like, it, th that's been a weird change that has happened that I didn't see coming. I should have seen it coming, like, logically, I, you know, <laughs> I realize now that I should have known that that was eventually going to happen, what with, you know, age and life uh, cycles and all of that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, do you have any interest in investigating, like, because right now you're really looking at a marketing aspect and a design uh -huh. aspect. Have you ever been interested in looking at the uh, community surrounding games and existing? Because these are all, like, single-player experiences. But yeah. But there are a lot of really big competitive scenes that are, while racially diverse, extremely gender-specific in terms of, or gender-dominated in terms of. What, what are you thinking of specifically? I'm just. Yeah. Well, again, th those are, I mean, like, they might be gender specific, but I'm, I'm more interested in games that are designed for a woman audience, not for either a gender neutral audience or for a masculine audience. Like, I'm really interested in in games that that have this vision of the woman player for whatever she is. So I haven't looked at that. I am, I'm actually very interested in, I'm, I'm interested in eventually maybe talking to more um, game companies that specifically make these kinds of games, right? Like, because I am interested in that ephemerality. I'm interested in sort of, how, you know, um, how it's thought through what it is that the, these idealized players, what they do and how they do it. Um, I'm also, I'm, I'm kind of interested in sort of the fan online communities because while it might not be player communities as in they're playing together, I mean, these are, as you said, single player games primarily. I do think that sort of the the communities of fandom that develop around these games are fascinating, and I, I do sometimes go to the boards, and I just I haven't written about that yet, but I, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wrote something a while back on Cooking Mama, and I have very complicated feels about that. Um, I. Uh, <laughs> Like, um, I feel like Mama is, um, she is trying to train audiences to a specific kind of what motherhood in this very deliberate way, wherein when she says, don't worry, Mama will fix it, it almost comes off like a threat, like, don't make Mama come fix that. And um, so, I, like, it's this weird game that I feel like is, is trying to, to teach people what mother, idealized motherhood should look like. Um, you know, and because w when you do it correctly, it's perfect just as good as mama, right? Like, and so, I, I mean, I definitely, uh, I, I have a lot of, of mixed feels about Cooking Mama. Um, Nintendogs, I, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a, another one of the caregiving games, right? So it's similar to, you know, um, Tamagotchi in that while you're not killing your offspring, you are raising a terrible dog if you do it poorly, right? Like, so if you don't do it right, then then you are just a horrible, horrible dog owner. And, you know, and so it is kind of teaching effective labor. It's teaching um, you how to take care of, you know, uh, things that need taking care of. It's teaching you mothering. Um, the, uh, I always, um, I, I always think back whenever I think about Nintendogs, there was um, a Fox Trot, a series of Fox Trot cartoons that happened around the time that Nintendogs was popular. Um, and I don't know if anyone remembers this, this is so random, but I really, like, it was in my dissertation because it, like, it, like, hit me so hard where it was, like, this, um, it was a series where the, the little boy, I don't remember anyone's names, but the little boy, what was it? Jason. Jason. Okay, so Jason had a DS with Nintendogs and the mother kept stealing the, the <laughs> DS. And, um, and then, there, like, the final strip was something like, Mom, what's for dinner? And she was like, well, I just fed Cutie Paws, like, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know what you want from me. And he was like, no, my dinner. So, um, I mean, and I do think that there's sort of like this weird commentary on, on motherhood maybe should like, if you, if you play too much, you might lose control. And that's, which by the way, in my book, and I get into this a lot in my book, um, is one of the, the things that I talk about with time management games that um, all of the language around time management games, you know, Craze, Dash, um, uh, Mania, all of those things sort of imply a kind of hysteria where if you're not careful, the play can get away from you. It can all, it, you know, you, you will become this terrible person and, and it, it will get beyond you. And, um, and I mean, like, uh, hysteria is sort of the, the, you know, obviously a gendered term 
that um, that has been going on for you know hundreds of years of of sort of this idea that that again women can't control their emotions. So so one should you know if you're going to play it could turn into a form of hysteria and there's there's a weird naming convention that was going on for a while where everybody was using these sort of manic speed terms to describe the gameplay which i i found fascinating and i think that nintendo that was that was a long way to go but <laughs> oh, yeah. um, i also think it's pretty interesting how a lot of the games overly overly busy but somehow kind of always keeping it together and I know as a mom myself this illusion that other mothers tend to have about oh you ought to be able to handle whatever no matter how ridiculous it gets and and not having that space to say this is overwhelming this is this this is that I think a lot of the games um, are about control, right? Like, I mean, a Diner Dash is a really hard game at the high levels, but when you win, you have this weird feeling like you can control the universe. <laughs> it's like this weird thing where you like you you hit a, and no pun intended a state of flow where suddenly you're like, all I can control all of these people. I can make them love me. I can make them all happy. It will. It is all fine. And in the real world, you don't get that. <laughs> you know, same thing with puzzle games. You have there's a certain like you know with Candy Crush style puzzle games. There's this moment of just like pure ecstasy of like I am in control of the universe. And I think that a lot of the games that are designed for this audience are certainly tapping into that desire for uh, control. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for coming today. I appreciate you putting up with the uh, academic stuff.